candle of peace. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. Peace is something our world, world desperately needs. Peace is something we desperately need. But where can we find peace? A true peace that will last. Peace is not the accumulation of strength. Peace is not the ability to force others to do what you want. Peace is not even the absence of conflict. Peace is the result of a heart that has been reconciled to God. Peace is the byproduct of a life that's been get, been changed by God. A life that now belongs to God. And God fills us, and God fills us with His peace. And that peace flows out of us to others. That peace is present in how we treat others. That peace is present in how we speak to others. That peace is present in the choices we make. And where peace is absent, we seek the Lord Jesus for it. We, tr we trust in his way. <coughs> we acknowledge his will. We walk on his path. We follow the example of our Savior. For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He is our peace.
very good. Never been so happy for him to fail a test, have you? Right. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm thankful that I got to spend the day baking things, and Jim got to spend the day baking things to give gifts to all of the church family. And it was a so true blessing, and we really enjoyed it. And I'm very thankful Thank for Jim to make a good loaf of bread. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I was thankful for the story of, of you and you and Melissa canning jelly too. Well, you know, it, it's funny as you get older. It's a little thing to like for me, okay? And spending the day <coughs> making the biggest mess I've ever seen this side of Mississippi. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> every pot and pan and everything, the stove top and everything. Just to spend the day with her making it was just, it was something that I will never be able to forget. It's a memory that I hold dear. Mm -hmm. But watching Jim make all that bread yesterday, he made a loaf for us for the morning, okay? <laughs> and then spend the whole day making bread. It was amazing, and the house smelled great. I mean, if anybody that cooks homemade bread knows, your house just smells wonderful. Mm -hmm. you, you need yes, you to do that more often. Piece of bread with butter on it. Yeah. Oh, yes, I, I got a hot piece of bread with butter. Okay, right out of the oven. That's a good phrase, too. That's one of my favorite phrases. A hot piece of bread with butter. Say, hey, you want to get it hot? It's coming out of the oven now. Yeah. <laughs> I was up out of that bed real fast. <laughs> but the thing they say is, family is the people you cook for. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. This is our family. We appreciate that. We, you're absolutely. Absolutely. Sandra, do you have a phrase? I saw your hand up. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Which that's always something I fumble over. 
But he said, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, he said, but God knows what's on your heart before you ever bow your head. God just wants to hear from us. He just wants to hear our voice. He wants to hear our heart. So let's bow our heads together and share our hearts with God. Lord, I do come to you and I I open my heart to you, Lord. I want you to hear from me. I want you to hear from us, this family that you have given us, Lord. I thank you for that. I thank you that you listen. Lord, I thank you for the blessings that you give us day by day. Morning by morning, your mercies are new. You, you bless us every day. Lord, help us to have our eyes open to see it. Help us to have our eyes open to see answers to prayer, Lord. We, we come to you right now and we have burdens, we have needs, we have those that we love that that need prayer, that need a touch from you, Lord. We we need a touch in our own lives, each and every one of us. We we need you. We need you all the time. Let us never forget that, Lord. We need you all the time. So I pray for a touch on each and every person in here and the burdens that they bring into this place, Lord. I just pray that we can we can unburden ourselves, that we can shrug them off, and we can lay them at your feet and let you have them and let you work. And Lord, I pray for the peace that we talked about this morning for each and every person in this place. The peace to know that you are there. You are not dead. You are not silent. You are not still, but you are ever moving, ever working for our good, Lord. And we thank you for it. We thank you for your great love for us. Lord, just be with us in the rest of this service, speak into our hearts, speak into our minds. Let us hear from you this morning, Lord. And Lord, the burdens that we carry... Lord, I just pray that you lift them off of us, that we will let them go, and we give them to you, and we thank you for all that you're, you're going to do, and we thank you for all that you have done. Pray all these things in the name of Jesus.
you in a certain way that happened before. The cry in the middle of that song, help me be strong, help me be, just help me. Well, I would ask you this morning to turn to Matthew chapter 2. And to be right there at the beginning of the chapter where we'll be. In this past week, and that, that really distilled thought, I guess I thought this before, Christmas to me really seems like a beginning. Um, and New Year's, as I... Christmas and New Year's are right there a week apart. And as I've gone through life and I've gotten older, you know, New Year's used to be, that's the beginning of a new year, but really I almost see New Year's as an ending. It's an ending of one year. But Christmas is the beginning. Christmas is the beginning of, of something new. It is the culmination, I wrote it down so I would have the big words there for me. It's the culmination of a plan that had been there since the beginning of all. It was the culmination of the plan, and it was the beginning of a new way for us to know God. It was the beginning of the gospel. It was the beginning of the final reconciliation between God and his children. It was a beginning. One of the things that I have I've learned in life over time and most of the time the hard way, is when all else fails, go back to the beginning. Uh, one of my favorite movies of, of all time, and it's not Star Wars, that is one of my other favorite movies, or I guess that would be a franchise, but I like that franchise, but just as a, as a movie that I really like to watch, it's called The Princess Bride. If you've never seen it, I actually recommend it. You might think it's the dumbest thing you've ever seen, but you probably think that same thing about me, and it's all okay. I love that story. It's just, it's, it's fun, and it's, it's funny. But in one part of that, one of my favorite characters says, you told us if the plan goes wrong, to go back to the beginning. Well, this is where we got the job, so this is the beginning. It goes back to the beginning. That's the thought that I have for you this morning. If all else fails, go back to the beginning. Because there's preparation from the beginning. God has prepared the path. He has prepared the way. And he has prepared it. I've said this before recently. God, I think, I believe, and I, I believe I could, I could argue this, God lives outside of time. Time is for us. Time is something that we have to help us go through and help us to have an understanding of what we're doing. But I believe that God sees it all at one time. God sees the beginning and the end all at one shot. And he pays attention to us and he loves us, but he lives outside of that time. But he has made preparation from the beginning. There is a beginning point and there's an end point. And it's coming. Absolutely it's coming. But he's made preparation from the beginning for the plan to work and the plan to go. So when all else fails, go back to the beginning because that's where the preparation is. God has made preparation from the beginning. John chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word is Jesus. As you continue reading that chapter, it explains that. In the beginning, Jesus was there. He wasn't something that was created later. He was something that has always been. Jesus has always been. And He is God. It's can I explain the Trinity to you in ways that's going to make it make sense and that, that everybody's going to understand? Absolutely not. <laughs> I do not have the words for that. That's one of the great mysteries. That's one of those things that we take on faith. But I can tell you this. There is God, there's the Son, there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they are separate and they are one. And they were all there at the beginning. The book of Genesis is the... It's the first book that we have and, and what we understand to be the Bible. It is the first book chronologically. It is the, the earliest events. It is, it is literally the beginning. And in the beginning of that book, the first four words, I think, are some of the most important words in all of the Bible. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. And when all else fails, go back to the beginning. He's made a preparation from the beginning. In Matthew chapter 2, 
I'm just going to read starting from verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and had come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who, is, who will shepherd my people, Israel. That was written by the prophet Micah. Hundreds of years before the event, the way was prepared. Then Herod, Herod secretly call, called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. And at this point, I kind of, I, I, there's this cinematic part of my brain that goes, Herod turned around and went, <laughs> because he did not have good intentions there. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and they worshipped him. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to, by the, turned to their country by another road. The star in this fascinates me. Stars in general, when you start really thinking about them and looking at them, and, and I'm a, you know, if you've been around me enough, you, you know I'm a bit of a science fiction nut, and I just, the way these things work, and it, 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 it astounds me. I looked up, the closest star to Earth is a number that is so long that I could not begin to, to, to tell it to you, but essentially it is 4.24 light years away from Earth. That's the closest star. That means that the light, you know, we, we turn on the lights and that's immediate, but we know that light travels. But the light that we see from that star, if we see it, because it's got other stars that are close to it that are much brighter, takes four years to get here. Four years and three months or so. That in itself is astounding. I don't know how far away the star that those wise men saw was from the earth. But it's the thought of the preparation of God. For that star to flare brighter at the time that it needed to, for the wise men to see it and to follow it to where Jesus was. Had to have started... If you talk about star the links and how there some of them are hundreds of light years away, had to have started years upon years upon years before those magi were ever even born. The preparation in behind it. I have goosebumps right now. I, I take my jacket off and show you, but nobody wants to see all that. We think about God preparing the way. And I see the, the, the prophecies that are in just, there's two just in this, in this chapter of Matthew. There's another one a little bit farther down. Boy, uh, verse 18 says, a, a voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. It was a prophecy about Herod coming through and killing all of the children beneath a certain age because he was so afraid of somebody taking his position away from him. This king of the Jews, I cannot allow him to live. Luckily, they had been warned and they went Joseph took Mary and they traveled somewhere else. But this, this prophecy, and it is fulfilled, and it is said hundreds of years, it is spoken out hundreds of years before the event that it happens. But I think about God and how he prepares things from the beginning. The plan from the beginning. This star, possibly as soon as he created it, said you're going to have to flare, and you're going to have to flare now. Because by the time your light reaches where it needs to be, it's going to take a long, long time. The preparation is mind-boggling. Even if it was, it's Proxima Centauri, is what the stars called. They call it that it's the closest to us. There's Alpha and Beta Centauri that are a little bit farther away. They're all three together, pretty close there together with each other. But 
even if it was that star. Four years before the event, it had to flare up so that it could be seen at the right time. You want to talk about God's timing being perfect, it really, really is. God's timing is perfect. When I'm down, go back to the beginning. God will give us a warning. He gives us warning signs. In this, there was warning signs. The, the dream that the that the wise men had, that the Magi had, don't you go back to know that there was something going on. The warning, if you read, you know, everybody in that time, if there, there was still schooling. It might not have been the same as our schooling now, but I know the men went to synagogue and they had... I would say it was kind of like Sunday school, but they had schooling there. They learned the prophets. They went to synagogue weekly, and they and they heard from the prophets. They had heard this verse that was in verse 18, a voice heard in Ramah, uh, the weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. They knew what this was. They might not have known what it meant, but they had heard it before. But these warnings that God gives us of things going on that you need to move, God gives us that in our lives. When things start going wrong, I can guarantee you God has given you a warning. I think back into my, in my own life and the times that I start stepping out of line, and God gave me warning. He gave me warning after warning after warning after warning. Now, did I listen? Absolutely not. Sometimes I did. I can think more recently in my life, just a couple of years ago, there was an event. It wasn't really in my life. It was in, it was in some way it was one of my children's lives. And God was telling us, absolutely, what, if, what the path that is going down, it may seem like the right path, but it's not. And warning after warning after warning was given. But in the in, in, when in doubt, go back to the beginning. We've gone back to the beginning. I'm a little nervous about sharing this with you because it's one thing as I read this and and Verse 9, after that, it says, After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen where it rose went ahead of them until it stopped where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And they go back. And having, verse 12, And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route, by a dream. I want you to hold that in your mind just for a second. There's one more piece of preparation there in verse 11 with the gifts that were given, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, um, gold and frankincense and myrrh all have a significance to the myrrh being one of the spices that was used and probably actually was used in the burial of Jesus. It's what they used to anoint someone. Gold was a gift given to a king. It was God showing what was coming for him in his life. But he warns them in a dream, that's the idea of a warning, not to go back to Herod and return to their country by another route. They went back to the beginning by another path. Yesterday morning, I believe that God speaks to us sometimes through dreams. I, I believe that wholeheartedly. Um, and I believe in my own experience, y'all don't think I'm too too kooky, but um, I believe that God has given me the opportunity to interpret dreams for people a few times. Uh, I can think of, of one time specifically, they didn't even know I was in the room. I was at, at Warner, it's Warner University now, but Warner Southern College, and I was covered, I was in the top bunk of my dorm room. We had bunk beds. And I always got the top bunk for some reason. I don't know why. I'm the least athletic person in the world, but I had to climb up on top of that thing both times. Thanks, Herman. You'll never watch this, but he might. He's on my Facebook page. But they didn't even know I was there. I was covered up. I was half asleep. And some of the guys come into the dorm room, and one of them, he says, I had this dream, and it's bothering me, but it's so clear, and I can't get it out of my head. And begins to tell the dream, and all of them are just... They, they're astounded. They're like, I don't know. It's, that sounds like a bad dream. And in that moment, I really felt God said, speak, and I opened my mouth, and I was able to tell him what that dream meant. My dad has had a dream before. He said, son, I just don't know what it means. I said, dad, I can tell you what it means. I believe in dreams. I believe that when you have that dream and you really, really remember it, a lot of times that is God trying to speak to you. Saturday morning, I had a dream. And I say Saturday morning because it was that wonderful time. I woke up pretty early in the morning 
and realized that I did not have to get up that early that morning. And that's a wonderful feeling when that happens every once in a while. And guess what I got to do? I got to lay back down. That was great. That's some of the best sleep, too. I don't know if you've ever had that sleep. You may not, may not think that. You may not agree with me. But that sleep, when I realize it's really early in the morning and I really don't want to be up this early and I don't have to get up and I can go back to sleep, man, that's some great sleep. So I go back to sleep because I was able to that morning. And as I was asleep, I had this dream. I was driving from one place that I was living. I would not say it was home. It did not feel like home, but I was driving from that place, and I had some of my stuff in my car. I can tell you which car it was. It's a 1987 Nissan Pulsar um, that my dad still has. It was, the, it was the first car I ever bought with my own money. The first car I ever had, Daddy bought. But the first car I ever bought with my own money was this Nissan. It's red. I love that car. And it's still there, and one day it'll be mine again, maybe. Mama, don't sell it before I get to it. But <laughs> I'll get in trouble for that later. But I was driving that car, and I, rem I, I could see it. And I'm driving to another place, and that place is home. That place is going to be home. There's a significance there, and I don't know what that significance is, but as you hear it and God reveals it to you, you can tell me. And if not, that's okay. He'll reveal it to me. But that place was home that I was going to. But as I got to that place and I pulled in, I realized there were some things still where I was that I wanted to go get. I know what that means. There's times in life where God brings us to a new place and he's got a new plan for us. But we want to bring things from our past. We want to bring things from our, from our old ways into it with us. And it wasn't the best idea. And as I realized in this dream, it wasn't the best idea because as I go back to try to drive from the place that God been brought, this place that is home, that I know and I feel is home, and I want to drive back to this place where I was in this car that I love, I get lost. And I know that I'm lost. I don't believe that I've missed a turn, but apparently I have. But I know that I am lost because I enter a cave. I go into a cave, and if you've ever been in a cave, and when they turn the lights, everybody, anybody ever been to Ruby Falls or Mammoth Caverns? They'll take you down to these places, and what was the one? What's, uh, it doesn't matter. It's in Alabama somewhere. I've been in that one, too. But they got lights, and they got lit up, and it's all pretty, and you can see everything and, the, and all the stuff. And then somebody gets the bright idea to turn the lights off. That's dark. There is no light there. None. Zelf, zip. You really can't see your... And this is what I'm driving in. Now, I tell you that I'm driving in the dark and I'm driving in a cave, but I'm driving for some time in this cave and I haven't turned my headlights on. I'm driving absolutely in the dark and I'm scared to death. Eventually, I get the idea to turn the lights on. And this is how I absolutely know it was that car because that car was weird. You had to flip the lights on and then you had to press a button for the lights to flip up. So I did that, and I was able to go. And about the time that I turned the lights on, there was a curve. And I was able to avoid the curve. And then there was another obstacle, and another obstacle. And there was all these obstacles in the dark that I would not have seen. But I keep going in this cave, and I just won't stop because I'm so lost. And eventually I get to a place, and this is where it came to me. I need to turn around. I've got to turn around because I've got to go back to the beginning. You can get into a place where you're in the dark, and yet you're still going. You're still going forward, and you have no idea of the dangers that are in front of you. And it comes into your mind that I need to find the light, and that light is God. Jesus is described as the light in that John chapter 1, in that, that first part of that book. And you find the light. And you realize as you go through the dark, continuing to go through the dark with that light, man, this is dangerous. There's all kinds of stuff in my way. I need to turn around and I need to go home. I need to go back to the beginning. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God. God created the heavens and the earth. Nothing that was formed was not formed by him. It also says there was nothing Absolutely, there was a void. There was literally nothing. We have no idea how to even how to comprehend that. But there was nothing there, and then there was something there. In the beginning, God, God made this whole thing, and he made a plan. He made a plan. 
Jesus was there. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was with God. That was Jesus. He was with God. And in the beginning, he had a plan, and he set things into motion. He set this plan into motion so that Jesus would be born into this earth. Not as a king, not as a superhero, not as some conquering thing. You know, we want to think of, sometimes think of Jesus as a superman, and, you know, superman, he come, and he's, he's all big and strong from the beginning. No, he came as a baby. He came as a baby born into a stable, born and laid into a manger, laid into a feeding trough. That's the first place that he laid. He came into this world as something absolutely helpless that could not feed himself, could not clothe himself, could not do anything by himself. Jesus didn't all of a sudden just miraculously start doing whatever he wanted to in his baby body. That doesn't work. He was a baby. He lived and he grew. And it was all part of the plan. And he went through hardship and he went through struggle. He had friends die and he wept. He had tragedy to fall in and he wept. He had people reject him and he wept. And he laughed and he loved and he talked. And it was all a part of the plan. And he went to a cross and he died. And he rose again. And it was all a part of the plan. A plan that God had from the beginning. If you get in the dark, if you get in a place where you just don't understand, but you see dangers all around you, what do you do? Turn around and go back to the beginning. Go back to the start. Go back to square one. You can start back again on the plan. You go back to basics. I thought of this verse, this passage, when it comes to the basics. It's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Beginning in verse 14. It says, And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. And may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Go back to the beginning. Go back to the basics. Love people. Seek after God. Rejoice in all things. Pray all the time. Pray continually. Encourage others. Help to be, be patient with everyone. And the thing that really got me, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all and hold on to what is good. There is a prophecy that has been made that applies to us every single day. Because it says that God, that Jesus, is coming back. It came out of his own mouth. He said, I'm coming back. I go and prepare a place for you. I will come again, and I will receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. He is coming back. He will do it. The plan is in place. The plan, it had a beginning, and it has an end. And if we get lost on the way to the end, guess what we can do? We can go right back to the beginning. At Christmas, I think about that we can go back to the beginning. It is a reminder of the beginning. Of God stepping down from heaven and stepping into this world. And saying, I want to be close to you. I want to teach you. I want to love you. I want to... To show you how to be. When in doubt, go back to the beginning. Every year, we can go back to the beginning. Every day, we can go back to the beginning. Don't just drive around in the dark. Find the lights, turn them on. Go back to the beginning. Go back home. I don't know if that made sense to anybody but me. But that's what God put on my heart this morning. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you that we have that. I thank you that you made a plan. I thank you that the preparations were made. The preparations are made for us. And every step that we make, that you have prepared a way for us. We have but to hold your hand and walk in it, Lord. Help us to have the strength to do that. To continually follow after you every day. 
And Lord, when we get lost, help us to have the strength to turn around and go back, to go back to you, back to the beginning, because that's where you are. That's right where you are. You're the beginning of all. Lord, I thank you for it. Lord, if there's any in the sound of my voice this morning that are in the dark, that don't know what I'm talking about with this beginning, who or just can say, I haven't ever had that beginning, that beginning of a walk with Christ. Lord, don't let them get to this day without starting that journey, without starting that beginning with you. This is the perfect time to begin a journey with you, to go to the beginning, to understand the light, and to find our way home. Lord, thank you so much for your love and for your plan for each and every one of us. Pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.